Shalom everyone, you all here again for HebrewInIsrael.net and uh, to complete the series about marriage and um, other issues inside marriage and other things that might happen such as uh, polygamy and things like that, I think that we have to end the subject also with the very unfortunate subject of divorce. Uh, I've addressed this subject before, I've actually addressed this subject several times throughout the years. Uh, because I met people that uh, unfortunately got divorced and they were debating over this subject quite a few times with different people. They came in contact with people that forbid divorce completely. They met people that were very forgiving and so on. And we, we have to say, before I even begin, I have to say something very important because it's, it's something that leads the way I understand things and therefore uh, can change the way people interpret uh, this uh, any subject is I'm not very into over-spiritualizing things, giving things a spiritual interpretation and, and, and trying to say that, you know, there, there's some kind of secret thing going on, something spiritual going on in the background that affects everything that we do. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to do with my upbringing. This has to do with something that I've concluded also by myself. I think the moment we push things into an over-spiritualized kind of mentality, uh, we lose focus on actual factual things. Uh, there are there have been too many cases where people spoke with me about doing something or not doing something because of some spiritual excuse. I just can't go there. Um, I think at the end of the day, Torah is still built on the physical plane, on us actually, um, on us actually doing things uh, without overtaking uh, spiritual interpretations. And I know it's a very strong thing in certain circles. Um, so uh, I'm just telling you, you, I, I'm not going to go into these all these spiritual things that sometimes I hear. Um, but in any case. Divorce, besides being a very unfortunate thing, is still something that does happen because at the end of the day, as I said about marriage and as I said about adultery and as I said about polygamy and so on, we are still dealing with something which is a type of contract, a contract between a husband and wife. And sometimes, unfortunately, and it, it, for me at least, it's heartbreaking when I hear it. Um, you know, and I, I, I have friends that have divorced sometimes even several times because of whatever reason it may be and every time i hear it, it really it really breaks my heart it, it, there's a certain pain that i feel when i hear these stories and the the thing that basically uh, has to be understood is that it's still a contract and we can't over spiritualize this thing it's still a way for people to come to an agreement and live with living together now obviously a lot of people get married for love. We're not dealing with arranged marriages as it was in the past. A lot of us get married for love. Um, and we have to remember that marriage, love, is something you have to work on. You can't just go, oh, I fell in love with them, and that's it. You know, there's this magical thing. Or, you know, uh, love at first sight, which is something which, by the way, television invented for the sake of drawing people in. Uh, there is no such thing as love at first sight. There is sexual attraction at first sight. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that love is something that you develop. I've even heard cases of people that got married in arranged marriages, uh, and it still, does still exist, by the way. I thought it's not as common, but in time, they actually fell in love. Uh, you know, when I first met my wife, and it wasn't an arranged marriage, we went on a date. But after a while, I started having strong feelings to her, and she had strong feelings to me. By the time we got married, uh, we did feel a lot of love to one another. And, you know, thank God our love has grown uh, ever, ever since. And hopefully we'll be together for a very, very long time. But we have to remember that if we neglect this love, if we ne neglect the relationship, then it can fall apart. And this is something that people have to realize and understand. Now, sometimes you might marry someone faulty, someone who has an issue. I have a friend that that happened and they had to get divorced and I'm, I I feel his pain every time this comes up he can feel the man's pain uh, so you know it does happen and it is part of life and it's, it's a way to stop the contract end the contract and release each other from the situation 
So the thing a lot of people ask is what exactly are the rules and regulations of divorce? And it's very interesting because the Torah gives two things, two things that define for us what exactly are reasons for divorce. Now, it's important to remember that in late Second Temple Judaism and post-Second Temple Judaism and Christianity, early Christianity, is part of this discussion. It was very common for people to argue that divorce can only happen if there is suspicion for a, a, a unlawful uh, sexual act. And uh, at one point, there were some rabbis that got up and basically said, hey, you know, I'm not too sure if this is exactly what the text says. And they started dis dissecting the text a little differently and came up with a different conclusion. And even there was uh, one rabbi who said you can divorce her even for really, really little things. Um, and there actually is something to it. At the end of the day, as I said, we have to remember that this is still you have to have reason to remain in the relationship. You can't just say, I'm going to stick to it and hope, hope it survives. Sometimes divorce is needed. Sometimes the relationship is toxic. Sometimes the relationship is extremely dangerous for both sides or one of the sides. And uh, what we find in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, it says, Ki ikach ishisha If a man takes a woman, basically in marriage, so the verb lakach is the verb usually used to indicate that someone marry, uh, marries a woman, uve'ala, and they had the sexual act to basically finalize the contract, and if it was and if it was that she would not find favor in his eyes for he found in her a, a an issue of uncovering the word here and this is the thing erva is not necessarily a sexual act erva refers to something which is covered now if we go to Leviticus it does mention uncovering the erva which is the, the, the sexual organs but I'm not, I'm not convinced that ervat davar is the same as gilui erva as appears in, in, uh, in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus uh, 20. What I find very interesting is im lo timtsachen beinav, if she does not find favor in his eyes. Okay? Ki matzav ervat davar. The structure, structure here is an im and a ki. The rule is in in, uh, in causaistic laws that we the main situation is a ki. It opens up with the word ki kafiud if, and then a secondary situation opens up with an im im being another plausible situation. So I at least the way I understand it is that and but it's just to prove this by the way if we go all the way to uh, all the way to uh, to um, uh, if we go to uh, Exodus 21, we see some of the first laws. So we see ki verse uh, verse 20, uh, verse uh, chapter 21, verse 2. Ki tikne evidivri. If you buy a Hebrew servant, then you do such and such. But then it has verse 3 says im, verse 4 says im, verse 5 says im, and so on. Basically, the key represents the main situation, which seems to be the main situation. Okay? Sorry, actually, it's the other way around. Is the, it actually really is the other way around in this situation. Sorry, my bad. Um, Im usually represents the, the secondary situation. Ki usually represents the main situation. What I find here interesting is the reversal. This is why I got confused for a second. I was looking at the text and my mind told me key was here, in was here. It's actually the other way around. So I apologize for that. What I find very interesting here is the im appears first, the key appears second, though im is usually the second, key is the first. So I want to put on top of this something interesting. Key would be a very absolute situation that he will divorce her because he finds something problematic with her. Maybe even sexually. She flirts, maybe there's suspicion here, and so on. So that would be an absolute situation where he divorces her. What I find interesting is, and I, I hope I understand the way the text is built correctly here, uh, I am an expert in Biblical Hebrew, so this is actually the opposite way, the, it's the other way around, because if you go to most cases, uh, and really, actually, if you read on throughout this entire text, verse 5, Ki kach ishi 
and then verse 7, ki ish, and so on, ki is used even in this text to indicate a main situation. Basically, you can go through this entire parasha. Uh, everything opens up with a ki, and if there's a second situation, it's an im. Here's the other way around, and as I said, that's why I was confused for a second there. I think the fact that the im situation is placed first is to emphasize that that's such a situation can happen if she doesn't find favor in his eyes. In other words, the ki the second situation, is not a clarification of what is lo if she doesn't find favor in his eyes. It is another situation which is a main case. However, it's been pushed as into the second part of the of the clause because it's actually trying to emphasize that there are other situations a man can divorce his wife, which is she doesn't find favor in his eyes, which means there can be a fallout of love from one another. There can be something that happened that has nothing to do with something sexual, that actually has to do with them, whatever might have happened, she calls damage, she doesn't like her anymore. I mean, it does, it does seem to be more like that. Basically, what it means is that divorce can happen for many, many, many different things and is not limited only to a sexual act, as some people will try to explain this. Now, um, there are denominations, I know in Christianity, that forbid, I think it's Catholicism, not an expert. Uh, if I remember correctly, Catholicism forbids divorce um, for whatever reason they, reasons they have. It might be because of something like this. I know sometimes divorces get annulled, which I'm not really sure what the difference is between divorce and canceling a wedding. It's you're canceling the contract. It's still the same thing. So it's like a bit of a like this type of situation where they try to find ways around it. Uh, but in any case, I think the structure here does indicate uh, actually an emphasis, as I said, of other cases of not finding favor in his eyes, emphasizing that, focusing on it, putting it first, and but still using the form im which is interesting, and then key being a main situation, but play second to say, well, that can also happen. That's one of the main reasons people get divorced, but we want to make sure it's clear that you can divorce for other reasons as well. So it's uh, what is not finding favor again is a very, op very open to interpretation. Uh, some couples just fall, fall out of love. Uh, some couples have disputes. Some couples just fight all the time. A husband can be abusive. That raises the question, can a woman de um, demand a divorce if the husband is abusive? There is that possibility because, again, it is still a contract. In the contract, he it has to provide her, which means he has to make sure, take care of her security because he has to give her food, clothing, and the sexual act. And if one of three of them, and I think that the rule, in, I, my, my understanding is the rules in, the, in, Detroit, in Exodus 21 do apply here as well as a general rule of what marriage is, and that's usually how I read a text. You can pluck a piece of information from one place because it does shine light on other places as well. The Torah doesn't give us a detailed description of everything. You sometimes have to read things in parallel to one another. So it seems to be if an abusive husband, you know, uh, doesn't treat his wife correctly, doesn't give her what she needs, it basically means he does not protect her either, if, especially if he's physically abusive, then it is plausible that a wife can actually go and demand a divorce in front of the elders and basically put a plea, and the elders will, might actually have to force him to divorce her, because again, we find this thing, she falls out of favor, she, if the husband's abusive, it means there's no, she doesn't find favor in his eyes, and he expresses this by being violent. It actually might be that it is, it is his responsibility to divorce her in such a situation, and if he refuses to do so, he might be in breach of something, I don't know if breach of a, a Torah law, but maybe breach of what's known as social etiquette. But in any case, what is the process? He will write her a sefer kritut, a book of cutting. Karat is to cut. I will make a video about the term karet in general. It is in the plan. I actually have done the research, so it's just an issue of making the video. And the Sefer Kritot, he, he gives it in her hand, he has to send her away from his home. So the thing is that what we find here is that he gives her another document. Now this document, the divorce itself, is actually finalized by giving the document of the divorce and sending her away from the, from the home, which basically means he no longer is responsible for her, he's no longer her covering, and now she is free. The document itself is actually a documentation of the fact that she is no longer married. She can actually go and marry someone else 
because what it what the document actually proves is that they've decided to sever. It's not as if they, he gives the document something magical happens in the universe. Some you know uh, you know something in the forces of the universe change. Same way in marriage, you you get married to something new for it doesn't know it's just these are contracts these are very down to earth it, it's like that thing that keep on hearing oh and someone converts to judaism they get a new spirit i, I, I just I, I can't even don't even even i don't even get started about that subject there are things which again are too esoteric and i don't think can be, even be proven uh as being true or not and some of it i think is actually very offensive towards mankind in general but that's another subject that's just me uh but what we find here is that he basically gives her a book that shows the, the nullification of the of the contract as we mentioned in marriage you write it it seems to be they wrote contracts oh there might have been an oral contract but you when you divorce you have to actually have a physical contract or a physical document that proves that you are no longer married and you are a free person so they probably also wrote some kind of a date and they were, and they, they may have written where it was. And in, in divorce uh, documents today, they actually, and I've seen those, they write, you know, where, whom, who gave to whom, every possible detail, people's exact names, if they have any nicknames and stuff like to make sure it is very clear that this thing is real, and you can trace the people that were uh, that were there when this was when this happened to prevent any un uh, uncomfortable situations of women getting married uh, into a second or third marriage, and uh, they're actually still married to the previous husband. Uh, the rest of the text deals with situations of she, she goes and she remarries, can she go back to the previous husband or not? That's already a different subject, but divorce itself, if I sum it up, it seems to be the structure of the text enables divorce for other reasons besides a sexual act, problems, sexual problems, and erva, by the way, as I said, is uncovering, which can also include that she behaves in a flirtish way with other men, suspicion that she might be sleeping with other men, behavior that might be appalling um i don't know whatever social etiquette it is if for example in societies where women are covered a lot more and she walks out the house in a bikini i don't know i'm throwing out ideas here uh and that might be a reason because it is it, it is in, in in modest societies it is considered to be something you don't do which might raise the question for example if a uh, a woman uh tends to go to the beach and she decides to wear a bikini, that or any swimsuit that's not that modest. If we're talking about modest societies, that can be a reason that is a, uh, a section. I mean, at the end of the day, what's the difference between wearing underwear and wearing a bikini? I mean, seriously, what's the difference? I've actually asked this question to women that I know that do go to the beach like that, and they stop to think about it. And it's all in their heads. There's actually no difference. Uh, but in any case, um, the structure itself reversing the Eman key uh is it very very interesting it might be an indication an indication of making sure it's clear that divorce can happen over other things but i find it very interesting is more of a subjective thing versus that seems to be something a little bit more legalistic leaving it open for legal situations and um and uh Personal, personal situations, and basically a book that is a documentation of the fact that the woman is no longer married and she has been properly divorced and sent away. What happens with this woman is already each society is a little different. Some places she can go back home to her parents if her parents are still alive and she's not too old. Some of them just go and try to build up a life of their own or try to find a, another husband. Whatever the case may be, uh, I hope no one will ever have to deal with divorce and people will be able to live their married uh, lives uh, as long as possible into old age. and But still remember, some certain marriages just don't work out. And I do not see any reason if it really, really doesn't work out. And you did everything that you can and it's still, still not there. Then obviously uh, the, the solution will be divorce. Painfully have to say this, but it does sometimes happen. It may never happen to any of us. I hope this sheds some light on this subject. I know it's bothered a lot of people. I, I even had, I think I have a friend that there were certain groups of people that would not accept him or were very mean to him because they discovered that he married a divorcee or he himself was divorced. I don't remember the exact details. This was a very long time ago. And I found it to be very, very peculiar. And that's when I started realizing that there's, I think, a lot of confusion about this subject. So here's some light on the subject from the biblical Hebrew text. Uh, obviously, comments are more than acceptable, 
And uh, don't forget to visit me at HebrewInIsrael.net. That's the website. You can contact me if you want to do a private discussion, HebrewInIsrael at gmail.com. Please make sure that if you do send an email to make it organized, don't just throw the questions at me. Build it up, introduce yourself, and put your questions into pieces. Um, you know, question number one or part one, part two, stuff like that. So it would be a lot easier for me to follow. I've received emails where people just threw everything they had in their heads at me, and it became very confusing. I wasn't too sure what the person is asking. This has happened more than once. Uh, so please make sure you write it in an organized fashion, and it will be a lot easier for me to answer. And obviously you can visit me at Hebrew and Israel on Facebook, um, where you can interact with my uh, small posts. By the way, some of these posts are just snippets of larger articles, so I recommend to go to the website hebrewandisrael.net and actually look at the um, at the blog section where I put up my little articles. Some of the articles are a little long, most of them are short, and uh, you can also comment there and I will see it and I'll be able to respond to it. In any case, hope this video was enlightening. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to make more videos in the future based on people's questions as well. And I want to wish everyone a kol tov.